But for me, big question, is this a golden age or a corporate age? So that for me is the big, big challenge. Is this the age of the gold <laughs> or the golden age? <laughs>like to introduce our, our panelists this evening, both uh, distinguished gentlemen who, who have worn many hats in their careers. Jeffrey Deitch was the founder of the Art Advisory for uh, the Citibank and has galleries in New York and Los Angeles. And here in LA, of course, he's known uh, as the director, the former director of MoCA. And Josh also as, you know, was a gallerist and the founder of The Bare Facts, which, well, I'll leave, I'll leave it to you, Josh. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Sonia, Bonnie, everybody here. Um, this is our second annual uh, Bare Facts event at Christie's LA, thank you. It's kind of, uh, for a while I've been saying that the 80s was a great golden age for art making and I was, started to write about that and it caused a little bit of a kerfuffle I think is the world that like maybe I'm just a grumpy old guy that the last good music was like Glenn Miller or something like that and we got a lot of reactions about that and I thought what well, in fact that would be an interesting topic so when we we're talking to Jeffrey it's like he had a lot of historical knowledge because he's probably the most single most knowledgeable connoisseur about the last 100, 120 years of art you will ever meet. So he's as much interested in what's going on today as 50 years ago as 100 years ago. And it's like, so we, we came of age in New York in a similar time that we are maybe nostalgic for. And it's like, so what's a golden age? So we got to talking. And so the first question is, what might a golden age of art be, at least for you or for me? Well, Josh, so we're fortunate to have both grown up together in what we perceive as a golden age of art in New York City. And so what are the ingredients of a golden age? Well, first, you have to have great artists, but it's not just artists. So the real golden ages are convergence periods when you have links with great musicians, writers, filmmakers, fashion designers, and that's what we experienced in the early 80s in New York City. So it was, in addition to the artists we all know, uh, it was when hip hop uh, came of age, and uh, great writers like Kathy Acker, who uh, connected with the artists, and, but it was a essential, it was a social community. And many people knew each other. I wouldn't say everyone knew each other, but we, that's what we say, everyone knew each other. Well, the art market and the art world and the fashion world and music world were all sort of combined in lower Manhattan because you could afford to live there. So I see that like Kim Gordon's doing something, Gagosian, she was like a board member of mine at by columns at the time, and we were doing records, but she was doing shows. And then it was a time where Europe was new to us too. It's like, I would go to Europe and like, who's this Richter guy? I've never seen that. And Polka, shit, what's that? At the same time, there's this guy in the basement, and in Nina knows eyes, Jean-Michel Basquiat. And then you go to artist space, and the receptionist is Cindy Sherman. And then there's writers and all this. So. Are we in that, we'll come to this a little bit. It, let's go back historically. When would you think of some other golden ages? Oh, well, we can go back to ancient Greece in the fifth century. <laughs> you know, that's really where we start talking about the golden age. But I'm sure it goes even further back, 2000 BC with Ramses II in Egypt. And so, well, the model is Greece in that golden age where you had philosophers, writers, playwrights, sculptors. Uh, we don't really know so much about the music that happened then, but uh, that was a golden age. And so these occur in periods when the economy 
when the political situation, uh, would, uh, the, the convergence of flows of people from different countries, that's when they occur. And we can jump way, way forward, say, to Paris in the 1860s. Okay, so I, I last year I did an exhibition of channeling Manet's Luncheon on the Grass. And amazing that Manet, every afternoon at 5.30, he would retreat to the cafe, to uh, Cafe Gerbois, or the Nouvelle Athen, interesting, it was the New Athens Cafe. And that's where the, the artists, the writers would, would hang out. He was a great friend of Baudelaire, and uh, there's also connection with great composers, musicians, of uh, the major opera singer of the time was his major collector, and uh, Joseph Farr, and then there was also Bizet who was involved, the opera composer. So that was definitely a golden age that resulted in Impressionism. And what's very important is this sense of the community that was the heart of it. The Impressionists made their own exhibitions starting in 1874. And uh, so one of the things that happens in the golden age is that it's very organic. The artists are very involved in creating it themselves. So it doesn't come from the government. Uh, it's not a university that does it. It comes right from the talent. And how did this happen? Well, there is a convergence of a reaction to Thatcherism and things that were going on in the larger economy. But Damien Hirst, it's really, it's, it's one person, one charismatic artist who was more responsible for this than anybody. And uh, also a convergence period with musicians, uh, filmmakers like Danny Boyle with train spotting. So you, these periods have that characteristic of crossover between the different creative fields and they're fun. People have a good time. And another ingredient is there is always an artist bar, artist restaurant. There was then there was the Groucho Club, um, and, and the period we were talking about in New York City. There was the Odeon, other places like that, and that's what made it happen. Uh, back in an earlier New York Golden Age, there was the Cedar Tavern. I think it's having started like the people saying, but Josh. I'm not saying that there's not great art that's produced at all moments of time. So it's not a statement against any individual artist. It's a statement about, as Jeffrey says, this collective spirit that's beyond any individual that all together go even higher. Now, now, so for me, the big question today, we're gonna to get to Los Angeles right now. Are we in a golden age here? But for me, big question, is this a golden age or a corporate age? So that for me is the big, big challenge. Is this the age of gold <laughs> or the golden age? <laughs> yeah. Would be like one way I would like frame the question because yeah. it's different, definitely the age of gold. Sorry, I'm not bending much. <laughs> well, you know, so as we all know, art has become so professionalized, financialized. Uh, can we have a kind of uh, golden age we had nostalgia for, well, I would say yes. You know, uh, we still have tremendous creative energy, but a little different. Well, New York is no golden age for art making because the artists are no longer able to be there. There is no bar, there is no Cedar Tavern, and the art schools have become very institutional. So I would say, New York might be the financial capital, it might be in some ways the creative capital, but it's not the art capital of America anymore. If any place is, it's probably here. So let's talk about some more of the ingredients of a, what makes a golden age. So one is, the, they happen in cities that are international, okay? So Paris was the capital of the 19th century. So, so the, the Impressionists were mainly French, but when you get into the 1910s, 20s, and Montparnasse, very international city. 
So Chagall from Bitesk, uh, Picasso uh, from Malaga and Barcelona, uh, it was an international group. And that was the case in New York City in the 1980s. The best German artists were there, uh, and you know, almost name your country, uh, South America, uh, less Asian artists than there might have been, but it was an international situation. Uh, in Los Angeles today, also, it's a multi-ethnic city, multicultural city, really like no other. So having this open vocabulary and people coming from different places, that's essential. Let me ask you a different question that's kind of related. I think for each of us, we have a personal relationship to when we first started to look at art, when art changed us. I'm gonna ask you, then I'll answer myself. Was there a moment, you came to New York in the early and mid 70s that you saw some work of art or some artist that fundamentally rocked you and changed your view? Because that sort of ties into your personal view of a golden age is what happened for you as an individual? Was there a moment in time? Well, I said, I, I, I lucked out. So I, when I was in college, I just stumbled upon a, a magazine rack in the art library, and there was a copy of Avalanche. And it was Vito Acconci on the cover. And I go in there, I look, and I said, my God, if this is where art is, this is where I want to be. And you know, art magazines, really Avalanche, had these wonderful, very austere ads for the different galleries, Sonnabend, Castelli, that no, no images at that time, just elegant type. And so I looked at the addresses, West Broadway, Prince Street, and I began driving down to New York City from Connecticut and seeing the galleries. So the day I graduated from college, I walked into 420 West Broadway, asked for jobs. I really lucked out getting a job with John Weber that was at the center of everything. I didn't know a single person in New York City that day. Uh, within a few weeks, but certainly within a few months, it seemed like I had met every single person. Because people would go to the galleries of, around West Broadway, and then it didn't take very long. There were like five, six of them. And then it was a nice day. Everyone would just hang out on the sidewalk on West Broadway, the wide sidewalk. I met everyone at John Weber's, uh, particularly uh, your, your mother. I remember when she came in, what an event that was. And uh, you know, so she, she sat around for an hour or so just talking. I guess she came in from Amsterdam at that time. And uh, so it was a kind of club and you'd walk down the street and you, you'd meet another artist. So I think very similar to what we read about in Paris and Montparnasse, that you would go to the Coupole or the Dome or the Select, and each of the groups had their place. And if you had something interesting to contribute or a little bit of style or something, you were just welcomed in. There's no barriers at all. And so it was a particularly a golden age for me coming as a young person because there were no economic barriers then. So it is, it's, if I followed the art world over the past 50 years, it's much more stratified. So that you have to have either a lot of money, a lot of celebrity, or like gorgeous looks to be invited into the elite situation where that wasn't the case, you know, that any enthusiastic young person was welcomed. So that's a kind of a negative, but uh, you know, there's a way around it. But I, I have you know, great memories of you know, just access to everybody, from the top museum directors, the top artists. And that was something very special about the art world at that time. If you were interested in art, you were respected. Uh, David Sally told me something very interesting when he made the film Search and Destroy. So he was used to how people treated him in the art world. You know, he was serious, he was respected. In the movie world, unless he was some superstar, he was like dirt. And he just couldn't believe how uh, people disrespected him and the film ended up being a disaster, uh, partially because of that. 
But that's one of the great things about the art world. We still have a lot of it, that uh, a young person who's serious uh, is, is usually welcomed in. Back then, if you walked, how many people have heard of Leo Caselli? Almost everybody? Okay. If you walked into his gallery, he was sitting there with the assistants, and you could just walk up to him. He wasn't behind, he wasn't four floors up, with three assistants there. On a Saturday, he'd be sitting there. Now, maybe some like Cy Newhouse would be coming in, but it could be just anybody. He was very accessible. So we've lost that accessibility there because the art world became 100 times bigger. It's just, it's not worse, it's just different. Um, I would say it in, would be interesting for everybody to think about, was there an artist that came at a certain point that changed how you saw things. For me, having grown up in the New York art world of there's Andy Warhol in my house and Robert Smithson at lunch, and I, I had these experiences as a kid, but I came back after grad school and I saw this show at the Guggenheim by this guy named Joseph Boyce. And I went, holy shit, what is this? And I, by the way, I don't think, has any museum in America done a major Boyce show since the Guggenheim in 1979? Well, it, this is an probably thing. not any curators here. It's like, come on, guys. It's like, well, well you know, you know, this is this is so interesting. You had a museum, did you do like a boy so, show? So, okay, so this during this come on, period, Jeffrey, why not? Yeah. So I would say, if people asked, if we took a poll, who is the leading artist on earth? Uh, it it might have been Joseph Boyce, right? Okay, in 1985 or so. Uh, and it's just, it's amazing. The market is not there at all. It, so, uh, I was asked in 1990 to name the most undervalued artist in the world. And I named Joseph Boyce felt suit. It was like $100,000. And it's still a Joseph Boyce suit. It's still $100,000. So right. don't always listen to me. Yeah, yeah. But it's, so see, the, the art world now favors style, glamor, uh, paintings that have million dollar prices attached to them. Uh, so Joseph Boyce, different world. Uh, uh, it will come back. Let's hope. So tell me, I'm not, I'm in New York, you know, at my computer all day. You're here on the ground in LA. You think this is a moment here. Oh, Who, yes. what, when, why, all, the, all those things. Okay. What do we need? To, so, don't don't so, tell anybody this is just for us. Okay, so L, so L, L.A. right now. So when I came to Los Angeles in 2010, I was amazed how inexpensive the real estate was. So, uh, you know, unfortunately... So you, you know, bought Century are giggling, City. You know, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's night and day between 2010 and, you know, and today. But, so... Basically, any artist could come and get a cheap studio, could be a garage behind a house. So, and then artists were more ambitious, you know, could buy five acres for the price of a two bedroom apartment in New York City. And it, it's interesting know, because being born here and being from here, I know I look like it, it, it was a movie industry town. Is it still? Well, it's now, it's very interesting. We're in an interesting situation where maybe it's the art world that's the coolest thing going on in LA. Where, you know, we all know in, in people who are involved in the business, like you know, now, like movie stars come to our galleries to buy art. You know, the biggest people in music, uh, the people in the, and, and it's, it's really interesting that uh, art has become the platform where everyone comes together. And uh, you know, people Don't say that- Don't forget the golden age yeah, of gold. That, that has something to do with it. But it's also, so what I want to say uh, that's very important about LA now is I talked about this convergence, okay? So in New York, the different creative fields today are more siloed that the musicians don't really hang out with artists the same way. But here, there is this crossover. So musicians, artists, filmmakers, designers socialize with each other. 
uh, something, a, a, a major New York artist uh, tested out living here for a year. And I, I saw her after she came back and she was shocked. She said, can you believe it? In LA, artists hang out with collectors. They go to collectors' homes. And uh, I said, yeah, that's what, that's what people do here. But from a New York perspective, that was something so wrong. But for me, that's what's great, that, that there is this mixture, there is this dialogue, and genuine friendship. So at this point, I think it would be useful if we had a few questions from the audience. You, you have one of the world's big experts here, so he can answer any question on any subject. We have a question there in the middle of the room. Art collector. Uh, an art collector, that helps. Jeffrey, a long time ago, I remember you telling me that out of every decade, only a couple artists will rise to the surface. And, you know, we saw that with, obviously, Andy Warhol and Basquiat and all that. But now there's so many more people collecting and so many more artists. Do you still feel that way? Like, what's going to happen to all the artists in, that are hot now in 30 years? Well, something that I also wanted to mention, because is, is that I read a quote from Theodore Adorno. He said that great artists absorb the undercurrent of culture. Okay, so we have to look at, and when you look at artists, are they reflecting the undercurrent of the culture? And that's very important in a golden age, too. If people are just making decorative work or something that doesn't connect with our time, that may not be lasting. Uh, it's, I think you, to answer your question, you have to go back to art history, okay? Like how many artists from the period of 1900 to 1920 do we remember and recognize? It's actually a pretty small number. Uh, I like the statistic. There are more artists living in New York City now than lived during the entire Renaissance. And I don't know about you, I can't name very many Renaissance yeah. artists. So why would we expect that like, 40,000 of them are doing great stuff when we, each of us can name maybe. Well, he can name yeah, six, but, I can but name there, but two. There, but there, so but, it's, a tr it's a difficult standard. Yeah, but there, there's something new that's going on, okay? So I'm of the generation where like, I, I was, I guess I still am, one of the gatekeepers. Card-carrying okay? elitist. You know, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. And uh, even though I like to, I, pretend that I can Skateboarding is cool yeah, and all yeah, that yeah. stuff. But, okay, so uh, it, until the, you know, our, our, the past few years, the gatekeepers, whether it's Clement Greenberg or Alfred Barr, or, you know, the, these kinds of people decided who was in, who was, who was not let in, okay? So now with social media, internet, it's a whole different thing. Okay, so let's take uh, an artist like Cause. So he's a friend of mine, I, I like his work. You know, very controversial among the elite. Is this a great serious artist or is this someone who makes big toys? Um, well, okay, so if it was up to the gatekeepers, they wouldn't let Cause in. But with this vast array of social media and people, you know, uh, buying at online auctions, well, Cause uh, is a king of contemporary art, selling for $15 million, and uh, major public works, uh, we can all see. So, so this has changed things a lot. So, you know, it, it's... Uh, I'm going to argue of the that, that the golden age of community, we're not there yet. The NFTs are a little indication of where we might go, the internet, cause, Banksy, a little indication that we can get somewhere that it's not based on the gatekeeping of Christie's, Jeffrey, me, something bigger will come. And I think it is about a community. I'm just, think, we'll know it when we see it. I'm not sure we're there on that front yet. Right, but this is, it, it's, so we're in a very disruptive period, okay, when, uh, Christie's can sell a Beeple sculpture for $20 million, uh, you know. It's a, 69. Okay, well, yeah, the sculpture, that was the, the every, but uh, so, you know, that is such a challenge to the traditional system. 
And so, and people who, I, I went to South Carolina to visit him and blew my mind. It was, it, so it's much deeper than you might think. Uh, but like, that's insane that that's the highest, one of the highest prices ever for a work of art, old master, anything for someone who's not, was not really part of our organic community. You have a question here. At some point, artists will get priced out in Los Angeles as well. You just mentioned the difference in property values from when you came till now. So how do we create a robust market for artists who aren't selling at Christie's and aren't selling for six digits so that we don't lose that population in that community? And as gatekeepers, don't you feel some sort of responsibility to also champion those artists and give them venues and attention so that we don't lose our community here? Well, okay, there's one sense of, you know, let the market go, you can't fight the market, okay? So the, the market has its own momentum, and so the artists, you know, maybe people are gonna move to another place that's cheaper, and there'll be another community. Uh, you know, a lot of artists I know of going to Mexico. Uh, but it's a much bigger thing that's not just artists. It's, it's the traditional communities in LA, and that's why people are so riled up about gentrification. So it's a much bigger, bigger issue in a city like LA. How does LA keep its vitality? And we, we've seen those of us who've lived in New York see New, much of New York become sterilized, and you know that a lot of the life is gone. Uh, so it, it's interesting because as a, now a New Yorker, New York is a much more philanthropic city and we, still we've lost it. And LA is, sorry to say, not a great history of philanthropy. And yet the, the energy to the young is switched here. We have that philanthropy and we still failed in New York. So I think it's like uh, you've identified a problem that I don't, no, right. a it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a giant problem for the fate of cities. And it's, it's, it's not, of course, it's not just creative people. It's uh, people in the service industries who have to take a two-hour bus ride to work in a restaurant. You know, that's, it's not sustainable. Uh, so, yeah, it's a giant problem for urban America. Yes, um, it's Max Dolgerser, I'm art collector. What is your view of sort of last few years phenomena of buy one, gift one? The question was, the, um, the gallery and artist ploy of saying, if, if you want to buy my work, you have to buy two and give one to some institution that doesn't really want it. I mean, I know well, we have I some didn't say museum it trustees it. here who are maybe <laughs> hiding from that question, or chair and trustees have been in here, we're like, Ugh. next question. Do, do you do that as a gallerist? Put it that way. Do you, do you have buy one, give one? Yeah, so do you have a coupon, is, I, I, you buy, you buy yeah, this is, this 10, is, you get one yeah, free? Yeah, it, this is, it is off topic, but people are always talking about this now. And so, so I, I've been fortunate to have placed some works with the Whitney, with the Museum of Modern Art, and the process is so rigorous. You know, you, you can't just go to the Museum of Modern Art, oh, you know, a collector wants to give you this piece. It, even if they're not paying for it, it goes through the same process as if they're paying for it. And I have great respect for that, okay? Uh, there's an, a museum I won't mention. Uh, it's uh, open for business. So any kind of collector who wants to game the system and get a work of, say, like we showed a work of Dominique Fung, a wonderful young artist, and so a person wanted to buy a work of Dominique Fung and said, well, uh, how about I give one to this other museum? They'll, and basically they'll take anything. But they're building, without any money, a fantastic collection of the best young artists. So, it's, it, it, it's not a thing of, you know, oh, this is good, this is bad. Um, but uh, here's a museum that 
wouldn't have the resources, that's going to have an amazing time capsule of the best art of this past decade. Um, it is a bit of a scam because people are gaming the system and then they're going to have access to the work that they can then flip. Uh, so uh, what, what I think is that the American Association of Museums has to look at this and set up some re reasonable guidelines. Um, I'm an artist, and then I want to ask a question for you guys to share some thoughts. I went to a studio visit with Jordan Wolfson and asking him a question why in his like very early career he can invest in everything for such a animatronic, like um, such irregular um, thing that's almost impossible to sell in my opinion. And then I wanted to know when gallerist or you just to hear somebody that want to, oh, I want to make something out of this world. Like, what is your story? I mean, if you guys ever encounter that, and then what's the response? I would say the art world is able to consume anything and everything. So as much as it's disruptive, it's, it's like 6,000 acres in Arizona, okay, we'll buy that. If it's like got a big penis in it, okay, that's good. It's, it's pretty hard in the end to get around the fact that everything in the art that artists make is in fact capable of being consumed. And it may be Republican collectors who like that thing that's very left wing. They're, they're fine with it. Everything is consumable in the end. Yeah. Well, my philosophy as an art dealer is if something is great, if I believe in it, there eventually will be a collector, an institution, who's going to follow me into it and get me out of it. And I, I've, I've gone over the uh, edge Jeffrey, many that, times. That's how I've lived my whole career, yeah, too. Yeah, if it's interesting yeah. to us, yeah. we think they'll follow. Yeah. If you try to game it and say, well, what's going to be interesting to them, me personally, it'd be a complete failure. It's like, well, they want to land. I, I couldn't pick it. Yeah. So, but what, what I, makes I ignore a, that. Yeah, yeah. You just follow your gut. Yeah. So, I think what makes a great gallery, a great museum curator, you just go for it, and even if it will lead you to the edge of bankruptcy, if you believe. But in what it, was your worst failure? Well, I, I can write a book about the Jeff Koon celebration, but I don't consider it a failure. Uh, you know, it, it was incredibly difficult for me, but I was behind one of the great bodies of work of the past 50 years. So, you know, I'm, I'm, even for but all the difficulty, success. I'm happy. That's a success. That's like, I did something great, but it cost me like $900 million. <laughs> did you ever do something you went, wow, that really sucked. Why did I do that? Did it, well, did it ever happen? Well, I'm, I'm still doing it. You know, I, I haven't learned my lesson. So anyway, this come, show come, opens at seven yeah, tonight. Yeah, yeah. Come, come over to my place and see the Refik Anadol show, where like a single piece of equipment costs a million dollars. You know, we did it. And so uh, did the Super Bowl. Yeah. Another question. So uh, I moved here five years ago from New York, and it feels like every few weeks... We miss you. Thank you. A new uh, gallery is opening. Many have now opened up second, third spots here. And on the one hand, it feels like it legitimizes Los Angeles as a center. How do you think that ultimately it will play out in terms of LA as the golden age? Or have we just totally become another commercial? center of the art world. Well, see, each, each gallery, if they do it right, they inspire a group of collectors, a group of writers, and, and so it's, it's not just a commercial enterprise. It's community building if you do it right. So you're inspiring people. And uh, I think a lot of people in LA are going to be inspired by all these galleries. So I think it'll have a tremendous effect. The community effect. here used to say, it's cool to go to New York to buy art. And that was the community, and then it's like, 
They would ignore the galleries by the same thing in New York, because that was fun. And now I think the community says, it's cool to be at Kordansky, be at the dinner, to do that, look at all these things. It's now cool to support the home team. Right, so, it, so for a long time, you know, people who've been here for a long time know, let's say, like, let's say, a uh, great collector uh, who was privileged to work with Eli Brode, that Eli liked to fly to New York and buy from Leo Castelli and, you know, from Gagosian in New York, rather even Gagosian in LA. And uh, so, th so that was a real frustration that the collectors, rather than driving from Brentwood to Hollywood, they would rather take their plane to New York City. Uh, but I think it's, that's, that's over. You know, it's, you know, people still do that, of course, to go to the auctions, but you know, there's no reason if you want to be stimulated by art. So much of it is here. So we have to wrap up now. I'd, I'd like to thank Jeffrey for joining me. He truly is the great connoisseur of the 20th and 21st century, and I'm honored to have Jeffrey here. Thank you, Thank you Alex sir. and Christy.